take it away, Lee. Let's have a bit of action. Welcome to another Liquid Bullet production. Um, thanks for all the subscribers. We're now at uh, 10k, so appreciate it. Thank you very much. And we are back with everyone's favourite guest. Uh, once again, on the Essex Murders, Mr. Albert Patrick. Thank you, Albert. Well, hey. <laughs> uh, thank, so we, thank you, Liam Ryan. Thanks, Albert, for coming. So we've just done um, the Sky documentary has gone out on the Essex Murders. If you haven't seen them yet, uh, there's another one on tonight, the, the third part. And uh, Albert's going to update us on it all. Yes, my views on, well, I've seen them because of the box set and uh, we were pretty sure looking at the, the draft uh, a good few months ago now. So, yeah, so uh, just a bit of background. Expectation TV were contracted by Sky to produce this documentary and it's taken well over a year to produce. So it hasn't been easy. It's been a, a hard and difficult time, particularly for uh, David McHale because he's fronted most of the interviews from the review perspective. Uh, several interesting interviews that uh, did not take place that I thought could or should have been in there uh, and I'll just mention as we go along refresh my memory for my notes. The first one was a police officer uh, who wasn't named, uh, who was employed and looked after Nichols, part of the team that looked after Nichols uh, in 1996-97. He said Essex police treated him like a king. He got everything he wanted and, and it, for me, as an experienced a senior police officer who's dealt with supergrasses in my career, it's wrong. And I'll say no more than that, that full stop. What happened, uh, if it did happen, I'm sure it has because of other people we've spoken to, Nichols, as far as I'm concerned, evidence was bought, and that is wrong. Uh, a witness who saw the victims at the turnpike, uh, he was interviewed, uh, and he was totally adamant that uh, what he said he saw took place uh, and that wasn't in the programme. Uh, and then we move on to a doorman who knew Tucker very well. He talked about the background and the, the work in the clubs in Essex and he also knew Wounds and Steel. And as far as he was concerned, uh, a, a miscarriage of justice had taken place. So that wasn't filmed. Uh, again, not, not, my, not outside of my control, but uh, we would like for that to have been done, but it wasn't. Uh, and then a particular uh, point for me is the time of death and Dr. Richard Shepherd, who flew all the way down from Cheshire to be interviewed in, uh, and in two words, three words, he said, Essex police should have at least attempted to obtain the time of death because we're sitting here today debating were they killed before seven or were they killed after seven? And if just basic forensic work had taken place, then we may not have been sitting here and Jack and Mick might have been out there and never convicted. Just a quick question on that, on that Albert. Obviously, now it's come so far forward and everyone questions about were the police sort of corrupting this. Would, would that have possibly been something that was avoided on purpose, perhaps? Oh, it's early days. We're talking about the first 24 hours, the first couple of hours of a murder investigation, which is all basic coppering, all basic forensic skills. That, that the, the, the pathologist, even the, the, the surgeon, even the SIO, should have known how important it was to try and establish the time of death. And in these early days, we didn't even know who the victims were. They were lying in the Range Rover, you know, uh, dead, obviously, from the gunshot wounds and what you could see with your own eyes. So there's no debate as to whether they're alive or dead. They were dead. So you've got to, in that first golden hour, two hours, three hours, do the best you can to try and find out what has happened here. It's like a road traffic accident. Excuse me, can anybody tell me see what happened please, you know. Look at the skills that are available and should have taken place. And for what I have seen, it was a poor crime scene management. To lift the bodies in the Range Rover, like that, up onto the, the low loader and off to the local police station. I'm sorry, but... So the police happened. sort of fouled really on their first hurdle there. Yes, exa exactly, and, 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 and if you'd listen to uh, Richard Shepherd. He would have given his experience to what he believed 
uh, should have taken place, but that wasn't in the programme. Again, not, not uh, within our control, but those little bits all add up to what I hope we would able to achieve was to get people to come forward or people to say, bloody hell, this can't have been, this should not have been allowed. Because, my, you know, people who know me said, and have obviously we, I timed them up to watch the series, and they're saying, I didn't know that. In fact, I didn't really know too much about the convictions until uh, three years ago. So, yes, it, you mentioned the word corruption. I think that's another chapter, and that comes later on in the investigation, uh, and, uh, and, and that's highlighted quite a bit in the review report. So just just one on that same subject, Albert. Obviously, you've had a lot of experience in murder cases and stuff. In in your career, how often has something like that been missed, or is this a one-off? I think you've got to look at the experience of the pathologist, and 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 there were a, a few challenges to uh, how she had dealt with previous crime scenes and had been looked at, uh, and and that's been examined, I'm not privy to that. So there's a question mark around, you know, uh, her experience and what happened in previous cases. And I'm not sitting here having a dig and saying, oh, uh, this lady uh, should never ever been involved or been struck off. Uh, that's not my opinion, that's not me. But from all the cases I have reviewed over 15 years of experience, there have been one or two where you challenge or say, you know, that shouldn't be done, this should be done, why did you do that, etc. So it's, this is just not a one-off, you know, that there are other cases that, uh, that, uh, that can be highlighted if necessary. But, uh, but is there any new evidence that's come from after the documentary's been filmed? Well, it's that, that's early, that magic word new, and I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll deal with that, I'll deal with that in a second, but uh, Bear in mind that the third chapter is out tonight, which is uh, Saturday the 29th of April, so not everybody will have seen it. Uh, so we're very interested in a call suggesting a different motive, and that's regarding uh, a drug rip-off in South End. I'll explain in a second why I'm not going to say any more about it, but we've got to investigate that. So here we are, a, a potential new motive. Uh, we have also been informed that uh, police were called around about midnight to South Hanningfield Road near the old windmill public house to uh, the sound of gunshots, particularly six. So the police officer who uh, took that 999 call, we would like to talk to. I know it was 23, 24 years ago, uh, and for us now to try and find out who that is, we're only ever going to know if the officer who did attend makes contact. Uh, so that, that's a, an important piece of new, not evidence yet, but it could turn into evidence if we identify that officer. Uh, it's still early days. Uh, we are still trying hard to prove that they were alive after seven o'clock. So if anybody saw them after seven, please make contact. Uh, and I've been making that appeal you know, for three years and I'll repeat it today. So. Let me explain why, even if I did have new evidence, to sit here now and explain it to you, I'm really, really nervous around doing that. And the reason being in that you want to give the CCRC and anybody else looking at it the best opportunity to enhance it, to corroborate it, to make it into something strong enough to go before the Court of Appeal. There is a particular person who is basically following in our footsteps and speaking to witnesses that we have spoken to or who would like to speak to and, and giving his account on YouTube as well. So I'm really nervous around uh, damage being done to the truth if I say to you now, oh yes, we've got a witness who saw him at 10 o'clock. And when we come to the sightings and the timeline, and cell site, you'll see where I'm coming from. That corroborates uh, what, what what I'm saying. So, so that that's that that's where I am in relation to. Being brutally honest, at the precise moment in time, there is no strong, hard new evidence. 
but there's a lot of people making contact who are saying things that that really really enhance our concerns about the safety yeah I, I think it's quite amazing really after sort of 25 years that people are now coming forward that never did before yeah yeah you've got you've got the asset group the, the the group who are on social media almost every day who as far as what they've seen so far from the the documentary it's the same old same old same old nothing new well there's a bit of that but there's also a bit of they don't quite know what else is being told to us that uh, we're not sharing just yet yeah so albert can i can you just explain in more detail of the sightings of uh tucker tate and ralph, ralph on the uh 6th of december yes yeah, certainly i just need to refresh my memory from my briefing note but i think it's important to explain to your serving members and anybody else who's looking as to my 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 thinking on this is to find out how a man died you've got to find out how they lived so it's crucial to try and understand exactly where tucker tate and rolf were particularly during the day of the six and into the evening and even the day before and even the weeks before but it's two big weeks before let me concentrate on the six yeah and and the first sighting uh, is at the Orsic Court and we know that Anton Johnson the landlord has been interviewed he's been interviewed and part of his interview his words were taped and shown on YouTube and it came across as that he actually hadn't seen them in the pub. A, a, a newspaper reporter, John Austin, has spoken to him, and we, David McKelvey in particular, has spoken to Anton Johnson. And he has told us that they were in his pub on the 6th of December, just as it was getting dark. Now, I've looked at all the movements in the morning up to lunchtime and looking at the weather conditions the only time and the, that they could have been in his pub with one other man was between 3 30 and 4 o'clock let me just check that so i don't get it wrong yes between 3 30 and 4 15 actually and i've watched the weather it's almost pitch dark at uh, quarter past four so that's a reasonable time based on what other witnesses and the telephone evidence tells us where they were during the day. So that's the sighting. And the important thing for me is that just before that sighting, they made the call to Paul Edwards. And I repeat again, we need to find and speak to Paul Edwards. So what was that call all about? And was Paul Edwards the, the fourth person in the Orsic Court that Anton Johnson saw? And Anton Johnson is saying this for the first time. He never said it way back in 1995. He's saying it to us uh, and other people only recently. So that's sighting one. We've also got, <coughs> excuse me, we've also got, uh, let me check, make sure I get it right, sorry, I do apologize. We've also got uh, Craig Rolfe seen at the Gray's police station at 4.30, quarter to five. We've got Rebecca Carr, who says that she saw a Range Rover and a Sierra at the Turnpike. And she says 5.30, quarter to six. Uh, and that's, some people have described it as a ghost sighting. Uh, she can't be right because of what I'm going to say next, but she could have the day wrong or got the time wrong. She was shown photographs of the victims and she identified two of the three as being the people that she saw and it drove up down to Workhouse Farm into the car park out in the way again. So her evidence is actually quite strong and I think she was called to court but I just say was the timing out and uh, was the day out but that's a sighting. Uh, and then we've got uh, Raymond Wright who saw a Range Rover turn into the top of the lane about 10 to 7, 7 o'clock but he describes the Range Rover as having grills on it. So uh, um, I think you might be right about it being a Range Rover with grills, but that does, and there was a fourth person in the back. That tended to say that, or people will say that was still in the back, but uh, my honest opinion is that they've got the wrong Range Rover and it's actually got 
nothing to do with the murders. Or it may be, we don't know, that it definitely wasn't uh, the victim. Uh, and then we move on to sighting two, which is you. One of the girlfriends saw uh, Tucker, Tate and Rolf in the Range Rover leaving 49 Gordon Road. And this is an important time, 1806-1807. And that fits in with the, mo the landline call that Tate had with uh, a lady called Susan uh, to say, tell the girlfriend that he's going to be late, he said to pop out. So there's a landline putting Tate at Gordon Road and you've got the new witness saying that she actually saw them get into the Range Rover and drive off. The next sighting is Andrew Reynolds. In his evidence he said 1805, but clearly it can't be 1805 because they're still at 49 Gordon Road, which is four or five minutes down the road. So that gives them 1810, 1812. So that, that's, that's that sighting. And then, excuse me. Uh, the next sighting we've got, and, and, and this is an important one for me, uh, this is again at the Orsett Cock. Uh, police officers were called, uh, so I'm going to start again, the Orsett Cock uh, and the DC will be attended, and that was based on uh, the victims being seen in the Orsett Cock. Now, is that the same sighting that uh, was described by Anton Johnson 23 years later, or is it a fresh sighting? So, Officers did attend, spoke to the landlady, the landlord wasn't present, they never went back. So my concern there is, why was there no follow-ups to the sighting in the Orsett Court? And that was in the evening, no specific time. And then uh, sighting five, uh, this is based on an article in the Daily Star, dated the 9th of December, uh, again in the Orsett Court, a pub regular said, I saw them meet up and watched them drive off shortly after 7 p.m. on the Wednesday. We've spoken to the reporters who uh, wrote that article, but they've got no recollection or memory of who they spoke to. Uh, so disappointing, but uh, uh, not a very good chance of getting anybody coming forward from that one. Sighting six is important for me. This is a fortune of war, uh, which is the pub on A127 uh, and from message 327, dated the 15th of December, yeah, a man, and this name has never come out before, uh, I only found it by looking deeper into uh, the material that I've seen. I think it's a false name, but he gave the name Dennis Wise. I'll repeat that. Chelsea, obviously footballer of the day, Dennis Wise. Is that a real name, another Dennis Wise, or is that a false name he gave? And he spoke to a DS, uh, white, and this is exactly what D.S. White recorded. About 8 o'clock, 200 hours, on the night of the killings, all three were in the Fortune of War pub in Basildon and were with another man, who is well known to the landlord. They all left together. 8 o'clock, on the 6th, Fortune of War public house, a man called Dennis Wise contacted the incident room and spoke to D.S. White. And D.S. White has written, wrote on the message, information sounds very genuine and may call back, may call back with an update. We as a review team have not seen the result of the inquiries that Essex Police made at the public house. It was a landlady in 1995. She's now dead. The pub is now a block of flats, but the son of the landlady was an alibi witness for Craig Rolfe in the Kevin Whitaker case. So, you know, was the fortune of war a den of iniquity? And was that, a, I'm sure there was some, same as the Orsic Pop, you know, that was a den of iniquity for a load of people as well. Uh, so, Anton Johnson, uh, was very interesting to talk to, and he he's he just telling the truth uh, as far as we're concerned. So that's uh, sighting six. Sighting seven is uh, from a, a reporter, Anne Goodwin. We haven't developed that any further, but she spoke to a, 
uh, a witness called A that she gave the name Ian to, uh, and we're still waiting for her to find the case papers to try and find out exactly the time. But that was also uh, our understanding was in one of the local pubs, may have been lost. So that's that one, no, no great joy in it. And we know that Stuart Armstrong gave evidence at the trial uh, that uh, he saw Rolf because he did, was identified in front of the photographs in the press of being in his pub, the Carpenter's Arms, at 8 p.m. in Rayleigh. Uh, that evidence has been tested, uh, and I think, if I remember rightly, he said he wasn't 100% sure if it was uh, Tuesday or the Wednesday. So that hasn't taken the case any further forward, but it's a sighting. And then sighting nine, uh, we've, we've talked about already, uh, Chris Bowen, the defence solicitor, uh, 11 years later, uh, made contact with, and listen carefully to this one, not one, not two, but three men, three, and I raise and repeat that for a reason, three men, on the way to work at the Rettington Turnpike, gone 11 o'clock on the 6th, when there was an altercation with a Range Rover. And their main witness was seen by the CCRC and Chris Bowen interviewed him, and he is adamant, and I've already told you, that he was interviewed as part of the documentary, albeit he's not on there, and here we have, he is as, as even today, right now, absolutely sure that it was the Range Rover, that the victim Range Rover, and described part of the index number uh, and, and, and other details about his sighting. That evidence went to the CCRC, and we know, because it's been shared on social media already, that they said it was possible. But for whatever reason, and there are reasons, that that I, from what I have read, could answer as an independent to say, okay, talking about white on a shirt of one of the people in the vehicle. Well, we had two good white stripes down uh, Tucker's arm, so that that's white. And when you look at the, the jumper that uh, Tate was wearing in the back, you know, it was grey with flecks of white. So in darkness, the, the white flecks stick out and, that, and it's the white you saw. I, I won't go on about it, but He's, his evidence has never been tested by people in authority. So that, that's a, a, a genuine concern for me as to why is no one listening to what that witness has said. And I'm not naming them because uh, uh, we want to look after uh, the people who may one day be called to give evidence at the Court of Appeal. Yeah, because that, that right there of its own would throw out the whole case, wouldn't it, if that's true? You need corroboration, and it's just a pity. He says that he called Essex Police, and there's, and we haven't drilled down into that because we're not allowed to see the 124 boxes that are in storage in Essex. So <laughs> lots of work to be done that, that could have been done even when he made the statement to Chris Bowen all those years ago. So yes, that, that would have thrown it uh, uh, totally, but that wasn't available to the jury. Clearly, if that happened at the time and, it, and even a month, two months later, the CPS would have rethought, you know, the, the, the evidence in totality against the woman. Okay, Albert, could you explain to us the victim and suspect timeline, including the cell phone information, please? Uh, we haven't got more than <laughs> two days, three days. <laughs> uh, listen, I've been working on this for a long time now, uh, and it's a difficult one. Uh, I realise that to present it, it needs to be top drawer and I'm asked for an analyst to help. Hopefully she'll be here next week or the week after. I'm going to talk it through with her and hopefully she'll present it in a, in a, in a better way that uh, highlights the concerns that I've got in relation to what Nicole said happened and what the cell site evidence from both the Crown and the defence's perspective is. But just, just to summarise, just a couple of the points that, that are a concern to me, and I'm not quite sure if the jury totally understood or it was picked up, picked up by the defence team to any great detail. Uh, I think I've explained already where Nicol said he was from six to mid-afternoon. 
but he gets invited on the phone by Steele to go to Mark's Tay for 5 p.m. The defence's case is that Jack Wounds, at 12 minutes past five, was in the Willowmere Caravan Park, which is just south of Sudbury, and that is supported with his cell site pinging off the BBC mast. And the distance between Willowmere Caravan Park and Mark's Tay and the timing is 20, 23, 24 minutes. So bear that in mind. And you've also got Steele, who says in his evidence that he was at Ardley, a petrol station, Texaco, I think, buying petrol, not diesel. He was there with his wife and he produced a receipt in court. I wasn't there, so I don't know the intricacies of how that went across to the jury, but me looking at now, we are now tracking Nichols account to see if it fits. So there's the start of the 10. Now, if that was true, then Nichols is not right, telling a lie or whatever about the meet at Mark's Tay, where still turns up in his Hilux, and shortly afterward, Jack Williams turns up in the Passat and they drive off in convoy to the lay-by at the Thondon Country Park and then drop down into the car park at the halfway house. Nichols, in his evidence, twice, interview under caution, says for that meet time was when the Range Rover turns up, 18.30 or just before. And the Crown's case is that there was two calls from Steel to Wounds, 18.03 and 18.09, when they say Steel was in the caravan park, was in the car park of the halfway house, when Wounds is with uh, Nichols, literally half a mile up the road in a lay-by. He then comes down and joins him. So questions for me there, why wasn't Nichols asked about those calls? And why didn't the interviewing officers put those calls to him? So I'm being a little bit suspicious here right, as to why those key calls weren't put. The jury heard that, that they were in the caravan park, in the car park at the, at the halfway house pub. And the, the defence's case was that Steele was in Bullpen Village or just going there. And he was able to produce evidence that the jury hill was in the way. And when you look at the graphics, the cell site from the Childer Ditch mast would have hit the Jury Hill and they wouldn't have got a signal in the car park on the side. But if you just look to your right, then you've got Bullpen Village and you could have got a signal there. So I looked at both the Crown and the Defence and I'm more with my cell site and mobile phone experience than other reviews and cases, is that the Defence's case stacks up more for me than the Crown's case. So here we are, that's 18.30 at the halfway house. Off goes Steele, the mycologist, off goes Wounds and Nichols, Nichols driving the Passat, and they go to the top of Workhouse Lane. Now I've driven that route more times than I've had hot dinners over the last year at least, and Nichols did it with DC Brown again, and Winston in May, June 1996. Defence have done it, uh, and we've done Google Map and A route planner. From the hungry, from the halfway house pub to the top of Workhouse Lane takes 21, 22 minutes. So if you add 21, 22 to 1830, you get an arrival time of 1851. Drops them off, uh, and he walks down the lane, it's two minutes. So he gets to the five bar gate with five minutes spare before the time of death. Okay, that, that's reasonable. You, you can say that's reasonable. But 1848, Nichols checks his phone, his voicemail. Yeah, and he's on there for a good few seconds. And he says that he was on his phone after he had dropped rooms off and he was either in the Wheatsheaf car park or en route to or at Meadow Road. That's what Nichols said. His cell site 
for 1848 Bernstock Red. So he's in the general location. My concern is that at 1848, yeah, he could he would have to have been with wounds, but he's saying he wasn't. It was after. So that's a timing issue there. The Range Rover and Steel go off in tandem to the Hungry Horse Pub, and that is in Rayleigh, and that took 60 minutes. We've done that, and that's been consistent. So they get to the Hungry Horse, still gets into the back of the Range Rover, and they drive to the crime scene, up through the turnpike, down into uh, right to the, to the, uh, to the uh, White House Farm, turn right, and down the lane. The jury, the judge, and Nicholl said that when Sarah Saunders made her call at 1844, that was when they turned right into the lane. Okay, so 1844 is when they were turning into the lane. Well, that doesn't fit with where Nichols and uh, Wounds were. And the big one for me is that when you look at the cell site and you look at the triangulation from the wick for mass where it bounced off, is that if you look very briefly there, the hungry horse is just there and it's way out of the way. No, it, there's no way could you got the signal because at 1844, that's when they arrived at the hungry horse. So there's a concern around Nichols' evidence and the cell site. You then move on to the defence's request to examine Jack Wombs' original mobile phone and it was refused. David Bristow examines it years later and he's down the lane with Jack Wombs' mobile phone and he tests it about 70 times up and down the lane and he doesn't get a signal of the Hockley mast. Yes, which is where uh, the, the, the crown say it was, he was down the lane at that time. So there's a concern about you know, the evidence that David Bristol has added to his case. Now this has been to the appeal court and the appeal courts have not ignored it, but just dismissed it. You're with me saying it didn't make any difference to what the jury said. But when you look at the totality of the concerns about 1712, you know, at five o'clock at Mark's Tay, eight, six thirty at the, at the halfway house, hungry horse, top of the lane. It just doesn't fit. It changes how the mention yes, it, doesn't it? I, I have I probably haven't put it over particularly well, but when I do have the graphics and I do have uh, an independent person with that experience looking at what my concerns are, I hope we'll be able to raise the concerns that there are in relation to what Nicole said and what the hard self site evidence is and the reality of it just didn't fit. It fits nearly, but it's not strong enough. Mm -hmm. And there's been no there's been no attempt to corroborate Nichols' account. They've looked at the battery at uh, uh, Ron Perkins and that was bought in October, so it becomes a bulb and changing number plates and not changing number plates and a whole load of issues that have already been raised that need to be looked at in, as, from a fresh point of view. Yeah, too many I questions. Hope, I, hope that, I hope I've answered that as best as, but it really is difficult. Uh, but if you if you break it down into uh, uh, chapters, sections, and I've done, I, I, I've I've done a graph here, and I'm just hope to show you. So I've done a graph here that spells out the concerns that I've got. Yeah. So that graph there is uh, when you look at that in the cold light of day. It spells out my concern. And it goes on after that, though. No. He says he was in the pub, the, the spread eagle up in Braintree, having a beer, and he rung his, his wife to say he was on his way home. What's that effect? Well, he couldn't have got there in time. It's just impossible for him to have been. And his cell site puts him up there. Yeah. So, so you know, it's just not what I've said here today. It is the totality of Nichols' evidence, which is a huge concern. So, Albert, moving on to the next question. Could you update us regarding potential motives and suspects, please? 
Yes, certainly. Now, th 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 this is a very interesting one. And I think I've said from day one that this was all about a combination of motives that came to a highlight uh, in relation to senior people in the criminal world of Canning Town, Essex, you know, London as a whole, other parts of the country had had enough uh, because of the behaviours of Tucker and Rolfe uh, and Tate to a degree because Tate, as you know, was in prison most of 95. It doesn't mean to say you can't control criminality from inside prison, but physically he's not going to be there to be involved in any serious robberies or, or aggravation. So let, let's just look at that. Uh, let me get my notes again, please, if I may. Right, the Crown's case. The Crown's case is that it was a bad cannabis deal, that Michael Steele uh, owed money to Tate uh, and, and he threatened to kill him. Uh, and that was supported by uh, Sarah Saunders' telephone call, no, Sarah Saunders telling Steele that Tate was going to do him in or, or, or kill him for that aggravation, but she didn't believe it, nor did Steele. Uh, and you've also got uh, Donna Jagger saying they were off to meet Mickey the pilot uh, that night. So the, the Crown's case was bad cannabis deal uh, and the lure down the lane was because they were off on a cocaine deal. So that in a nutshell is the Crown's case. Uh, the next motive is, and, and it's come across on the documentary as well, that Nipper Ellis' dad did it. Uh, well, you've seen that interview, or your members will have seen that interview. We interviewed him. Uh, and I've described already that, that Nipper is a lovely bloke. He's caught up in, he was made so taken, he, he's admitted uh, shooting him that put him in hospital, that put him back in prison. So if you look at, if you look at uh, Nipper Ellis's account that his dad did it, there is no corroboration of his account. And being brutal honest, I don't believe him. He, he may have believed that his dad did it, but there's, I don't think his dad did. So that that's, uh, Motive B, uh, retribution for the death of Leah Betts. That's come across in the Sky documentary as well. Uh, you've all got the book, all your members are entitled to the views, uh, and I'll and I'll stop it now. As far as I'm concerned, the father of Leah Betts was not involved, uh, and in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and if you look at his interviews and the background to him, uh, I don't believe honestly that he had a clue what was happening around the deaths of Tucker Taylor. Uh, he's definitely really pleased that the guy who ran Raquel's uh, has, has, his life's been taken. He's passed away now, by the way. So so as far as as far as Leah Betts is concerned, I don't think so. But it was the height, ecstasy, the raves, you know, that, that was the drug scene in the whole country in 94, 95, wasn't it? So 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 no to that one. Uh, then we've got the ret this is an interesting one, the retribution for the death of Kevin Whitaker. And we know that uh, Tucker and Rolf gave evidence at the coroner's court, the inquest, uh, and we've received intelligence that makes that quite a strong motive, aggravation of a drugs deal, Cannon Town firm from Harrow, you know, uh, from Romford Way. Uh, say no more about it other than the fact that it is a possibility. So that, that is a motive that needs further investigation from what we have uncovered. I've kept an intelligence schedule. You've heard me talk about the Essex Police 1196. Well, I've kept for a view one and, and there's good intelligence in there that for me, with my experience, senior detective, review officer, I harp on again, it needs looking at. Full stop. So one day somebody will listen. <laughs> the next one is, and, and this is an interesting one, John McCarthy. Now he, he comes up uh, through information from Donna Jaggers. Uh, he was at the house that weekend, uh, days after the death, but he's named as being involved at, excuse me, he's named as being involved in, in, in the drugs empire. Yeah, I believe he's from Kent somewhere. I uh, haven't really been able to dig too much into his background. I've been told that he helped or paid for Pat Tate's funeral uh, and uh, he 
was there when the police uh, were at uh, 49 Gordon Road. I think it was on the Sunday the 9th when there was uh, inf the information on the other telephone, the 316 phone that, uh, that Lizzie Fletcher had. Uh, and, and Sarah Saunders wanted to make sure it was got back to the right people. So he, he's a potential, but not digging any. Uh, Essex police appear not to have interviewed him. I haven't seen a statement, I haven't seen an action uh, rel relative to him. Uh, move on, a big one for me, and I'll, I'll say again, Paul Edwards. You cannot have a man who has spoken to the victims three times on the day in question, the afternoon, the early evening, and in 1826, and, and interesting, because this is a cell site again, 1826 puts Pat Tate within range of the Langdon, Langdon, was his Langdon LA, Langdon Mast, which is now down on a block of flats it used to be. And you've got Paul Edwards, South Hockenden, and if you look at the intelligence we've uncovered around Paul Edwards, he would say, come on Essex, why on earth have you spoken to this man? And, and I can't find anything. Well, he did, he, he solicitor rung up and said, doesn't want to talk to you. We've been told he off to Tenerife, kept out of the way. Now that might have been for other reasons, but he is a man that we really, really wish to speak to. We've had a bit of information that he's back in Essex, and we've had information that he had fish and chip shops, and we've had information that he is uh, around, but we haven't seen him yet. <laughs> Michael Bowen, Man Mick Bowman, now the, Bowman, sorry, yes. The reason we want to talk to Michael Bowman is that 1707, yes, he was in communication on the mobile phone, if I remember rightly, with Tucker. We want to know what that's all about. I want to understand why the Uzi submachine charge that uh, he was, when, when the gun was found through Donna Jaggers, the Uzi, uh, why that case was discontinued. Uh, we, we've got a, a, a gentleman that you interviewed, Ray Bishop, uh, who comes across really well, I think. Uh, I'm asking Ray, if you can, or even you've got contacts, like, for Ray to do an introduction to Mick Bowman. He actually lives not too far from where I live, but I'm just very nervous and not getting any younger to go and knock on somebody's door and say, excuse me, can you talk to me about the right to murders? So when he was arrested, specific time, uh, specific call was not put to him. And I think it was a Mick Bowman that was ringing up the next day saying, are you okay, are you okay, where are you? What staff are you? If I remember rightly on the answer form. I'm not saying he's involved, but there is intelligence to say that he was in, 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 in that group and involved in drugs. Uh, so I, I may be just a person of interest rather than a suspect in a motive. So that's it. Uh, one day, one day, Michael, I'll say hello to you. <laughs> I look forward to it. Have I a beer? David Redmond, money owed by Tucker. And, uh, and, um, and we have done a lot of work around that. And I, I won't repeat it, but you know my involvement in the Group 4 armed robbery in 18, 1989. Uh, he's named in the intelligence. Sadly, David Redwin has passed away, uh, but when Essex police arrested him for drugs, and I checked the interview again this morning, not one single question put to him about the murders. Yeah, the just summary of the, he was interviewed for minutes, three times, charged with drugs, and that was it. But, but David Redwin is, is definitely of interest, uh, wrapped around Tucker in the, in the, the Holloway's nightclub in Bromford, and a whole lot of other intelligence we've received about him and others. William Jasper. Right, why could we find William Jasper? Well, William Jasper has been locked away in prison for just as long as Jack Williams. Oh. He came, yeah, well, yeah. I have spoken to personally, face to face, a very close family friend of William Jasper, and we're not there yet, but hopefully with the help of the close family friend, 
will be able to speak to Billy Jasper direct. Now, Billy Jasper's account, as I'm sure you've heard from David McKelvey and other channels, is compelling. What I'm saying here today, and I've said it before, yes it is, but be careful. Yeah, Unless I have heard it personally from his lips, and he answers quite a number of questions to my satisfaction, I will always be careful about listening to an account. Now, when you look at it, Essex Place, why on earth did you not do the basics in relation to his account, which I think you'll find is going to be coming out on social media soon, exactly what he said and what he wrote. Uh, there's challenges as to whether we should do that or yes or no, but coming soon, I, I think you'll find, is his total confession. And for Essex Place not to do anything about it is unbelievably unprofessional. Is it corrupt? I don't think so. Uh, did who, you know, we, we mentioned that name before and to people and they, they don't, can't even remember, don't know. If that information had been received into my incident room, the detective sergeant Daisy who interviewed him did the paperwork, wrote up what they'd done, submitted the, the tapes and, and a summary of what they said. That would have been raised at an office meeting. You would have then have raised actions, and I've said this before, but I'll repeat it because it's so crucial to what has happened in this case that brings doubt in to the the exhaustive or non-exhaustive lines of inquiries that were taken by Essex Police way back in 95, 96. Yeah. So Even to me, that just seems like it should be common practice to you know, look into that path just in case, you know, to mitigate it and move it out. Can I just say now, two, just one thing, CCTV at the gym, CCTV at the Palms Hotel, right? Just that alone, and if you don't have Mr. Jasper getting into a vehicle and hope you get an index number, yeah, any time that around the time that he said that night, if I remember rightly, the six, then you start thinking, what's all right? I, I think from Jasper's perspective, it's a bit of what he's had street talk and also could well be he was there and did what he did. The big one for me is in the car park for one hour and 50 minutes, sitting, yeah, he says, in just over Battle Bridge. What would he sit in there for an hour and 50 minutes? You know, does he actually know more? And why was he, why was he shot? He, he went in four years, he came out from the, the kid he was in trouble with when he was did the interview, he comes out and he's shot twice. You know, he should be dead, really. He's lucky to be alive, yeah. And, and, and here he is, he's out, no, obviously, please for him, uh, but we're just taking it easy and gentle with him and let other people do the work for us, hopefully. If it doesn't happen, then we're going to have to bite the bullet and just go and yeah. We know where he is. Yeah, David has spoken to him uh, and by that time, yeah, really should be cops to it in my view and you know, get on with a reinvestigation. <laughs> I'm not going to it's wait three years for that one. <laughs> okay, said enough. Source B, he was interviewed by us. In fact, he made contact with us. He then agreed to be interviewed on Sky, and that happened and that took place, put it up unnamed. And his account was, he ordered the contract, he paid for it, and he was round the table when it was discussed. That's changed. He's now denied that. But when you look at what we've uncovered and what, what the paperwork says, in 2011, he said exactly the same to customs officers. And our question is, as a review team, well, tell us what you did about it. Did you tell us it? You know, have you disclosed to other authorities? And what's that all about? When you look at the interview, I'll let you make your own mind up. 
But if you look at my body language with Nipparellis, and you look at my body language, uh, body language with the hooded man, I, I, I think people out there who know me will know where I'm coming from. Being cautious, uh, and it's ABC, accept nothing, believe no one, challenge everything. And that's me. Next. <laughs> okay. We're still keen, we're still keen to find the PC who we believe answered the 999 call uh, to near the old windmill. And that, I'm not going to talk about it anymore because I'm concerned if I say something that other people will hear, that person maybe got that. So I'll leave it there. The PC, I'm not bothered about the PC because he, he's just doing his job and if he took the 999 call to six shots near the old Moonball pub, then please get in touch. So that's another potential motive. And then the last one, uh, uh, we've been told that uh, there was a robbery of a safe house in South End, and that Tucker, Tate and Rolf were involved. And again, not going to go into names or details, but that is a, a line of inquiry that's pricked our ears up and it actually fits in with what, what we know from our, investiga our, our review investigation so far. So I, am I pleased about the, the Sky documentary? Yes, it's got it out to the wider audience. Could there have been more in there? Yes, there could have been more in there. Uh, and I knew you were going to ask me another question. <laughs> yeah, one more question for you. Um, is there anyone else you wish to interview? And if so, what's the reasons for that? Yes, there are. Uh, but I've lost my notes on that, so just <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Here we go. <clears throat> right. Who, who, do, who else do I want to talk Well, clearly Paul Edwards, uh, let's say no more, we want to talk to Paul Edwards. Mick Bowman, I've talked about Mick. Uh, John McCarthy, I've talked about John McCarthy. Andrew Reynolds, to me, is an important witness. Just just to tidy up uh, what happened with the VW Polo. You know, that, that his statement says that he left it on the forecourt with the keys, the keys and the glove box, uh, and, and who brought it, and how many times had it been in for repairs, and what has he had anything as to who took it away? And and open also to anybody who does know, you know, friends of the girlfriends who know exactly where the VW turned up. Uh, and and that, that to me could just help prove alive after seven. Because if it was Tate that drove it to say South End or drove it and left it at South Oppenden, then that moves it further away from the time of death, eighteen fifty nine. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, good. So so that's him. Andrea, Billy Jasper I've talked about. There's a lady dog walker, I have mentioned this already. There's a, a, an information from the landlord of the Bell Public House uh, at 10 o'clock, 10.30, one of his customers, a lady uh, on the 6th, uh, was walking dog and she heard gunshots. Uh, and we can't find her. Well, it's the police haven't found her, we haven't found her. So Mr. Evans or the landlord, or anybody in the bell can remember the lady who was walking the dog and heard the gunshots would like to hear from her. Does that make, yeah, is that, that clear? Uh, and oh, we've spoken to Gary, just mentioned we have spoken to Gary Jackets, just to try and put some reality into the, the, the booking at the, 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 the restaurant in Romford, what was it called? The, Global, global Metcalf, the Global Metcalf at 8.30. Gary Jackets was the manager. He left there, became a policeman, and he's now a civilian policeman. So we've talked to him, he said, look, we were busy as hell that night. Yes, they did make a booking. They didn't turn up, I never saw them, but it didn't trouble us because they were regulars and, and were used to, used to attack in particular because he, I think he had an office in, the, in that block and he was running uh, Hollywood's next door on the same street. So they weren't troubled about that booking and they didn't receive any calls into the restaurant to say they couldn't make it or they cancelled it, put it off. So spoken to the manager, uh, he 
<coughs> he didn't see any real issue around him not turning up. It, you know, it was, it was. Yeah. I think a lot of people go on about that as well because they didn't turn up for the meal. That's why they was killed at that time. But I, I've done it myself. We booked a restaurant and. You, you don't make it, you're running late, and you, you just forget to yeah. phone up for a courtesy call. It's just, it's like I think it's just one of the things. Every time they've yeah. been there, been fined 100 quid, because I haven't had time to put it on. Exactly that. I, I'm not on the, on the, the rota, or whatever the word is. Yeah, let, let's make this quite clear. There's members of the public, and on all the channels, and Essex Boys, or whatever you want to call them, who believe that they were killed, yes, by steel wolves. And the time of death is eight, is close to seven o'clock, call it seven o'clock, yeah. So if they believe it, and they believe that Jack Wombs and Michael Steele are guilty and the jury came to write about it, get on with it, life, done. They've been in prison, they've done their time, let them out. Because I, I can't see why Jack Wombs is out. I know he's a model prisoner, I know he behaved, but still hasn't done any, any worse or any less than Jack Wombs when it comes to their late murder. So in relation to their account, yes, Believe it. Personally, from my experience in contract well, killings, must be walking around it, is in their ears if they don't. it is a damn set more realistic that the time of death is as per Stephen Rogers, the farmer, and I've spoken to Stephen, I've stood where he was, I've looked at where he had in the direction which is from Workhouse Farm, and he, well, he was on uh, the Sky documentary, and he is quite sure, he could be wrong, but I don't think he's wrong about hearing, in fact, he, he actually said in interview six, and I didn't pick up on it until after, but he's actually said six times, is that because I've mentioned six uh, uh, accidentally to him, because there was definitely uh, at least six, if not more, but we know there was eight, uh, eight shots in total fired, uh, only seven cartridges recovered from the uh, workhouse lane. Uh, so, so he, and, and, and that's a more realistic time to not be seen, to be getting on with criminality with no potential witnesses because, well, let's be fair about it, it's snow and it's cold, it's wet, miserable, uh, there's not going to be a lot of people about it. Whereas, rush hour, and don't forget that road, that was now, it's now the 1245, I think it used to be the old day, 130. Both ways busy, stuff. and and I've also looked at the top of the lane. There is not a single, from what I have seen, and I know the photographs are not that great. Tire marks turning coming from the turnpike and turning right into the lane, as per Nichols account. Loads of them, most of them, I think all of them, come from the farm. So when you look at and and I and I have I've been there more times than I've dinners now. That bend is actually dangerous, and if you try and turn right you will have been seen. Yeah, and the height that this case has had way back in 95, you know, when it happened, there would have been somebody in that queue, somebody on the way home from work, who would have seen a Range Rover waiting to turn right into that lane. Yeah, especially as you say, back then, when that was the main A130, and, and that, at rush hour. It they was would have seen a sat sitting to wait and turn right twice. Yeah, so... So it's just not the Range Rover, it's the Passat. So it's, uh, and, and then park all that, they could be killed at another time. Yeah. They were alive at 18.44 plus three minutes, 25 seconds, we know that. Yeah, so when the call from Sarah to Pat Tate took place. So that's the last time. Uh, all, but, you know, go back to the witness at the turnpike at 11 o'clock. Now that needs to be, examined by people in authority. Seriously. You know, that man is, uh, is, from our perspective, needs to be listened to. I read a comment from a, 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 is from one of the, the prison officers in Belmarsh. And he says, you know, I was in a secure unit at Belmarsh. I knew Steele and, and, and uh, Jack Wombs very well, obviously, because I'm looking after them. Uh, described Steele, described Wombs, uh, and from his experience of seeing criminals every day, he says it's about time somebody started to listen because he, in all the monthly Sundays, and he knew Nichols, all the monthly Sundays, the account that Nichols gave was not the truth. And I'm sitting here now, 
on the 29th of April 2023 and send to your members and the public I've got the same vibes from my experience. Michael Still and Jack Williams are totally innocent of the murders of Tucker, Tate and Moore on the 6th of December 1995. Drugs is a different story. I made my mind up on that one. Yeah. But there were banker rights on the 13th of May 1996 when they were arrested. So that's me, Albert Patrick. Okay, we wind it up there, Albert. Thank you ever so much for coming on. Pleasure. Uh, we're going to move on to a part six with you with um, questions and answers from the viewers. So um, we look forward to that one. Thank you. Thank you.